Fighting against injustice across Connecticut, Melissa in the Morning checks in with the Commission on Human Rights and Opportunities on WICC 600. Good Lord, do I love this topic. Oh, joining me this morning is Spencer Hill with the Commission on Human Rights and Opportunities. Good morning, Spencer. We're talking about media bias. Oh, <laughs> yes. Good morning. Thank you for having me again. Good Lord. No, it's no problem. The reason I'm so passionate about this is because it actually kind of saddens me. I've got to be honest with you, Spence. When I first decided I wanted to be a reporter, uh, it was it was years ago, but it was uh, during a, a time where you watched the news, you got the facts, and you moved on with your life. You know, you watched the 6 o'clock news, yep. you, you learned the stories, and you moved on. And, and maybe you talked about it around the dinner table or whatever. Um But we have become this format of news, the kind of news that we do here on WICC in the mornings. It's it's kind of more rare. You might find it in more local news, but national news, network news, um, it's very opinionated. Uh, That's more of the basis is this is how I feel and let me support telling you why I feel this way. And and unfortunately, that's why you've got such a divided nation. There are many reasons. But to me, I think the media plays a big role in why people feel so strongly about something and feel so strongly about the other side of that argument. Would you agree? Absolutely. I mean, uh, media coverage kind of shapes how we see the world. It, it shapes kind of our, our perceptions of, of not only what is going on, but what are the things we need to be looking out for. And and even when you're kind of done reading the news story, that the way the kind of media can frame things is going to stay with you throughout your day and just influence just kind of everything as you're, as you're going about the world. So it, it's incredibly important that we kind of look at how the world is being covered by the media. Mm-hmm. It's also very manipulative. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, I, I think that's yeah. what drives me the most crazy, to be honest, because I can hear when, uh, like, so f- my mind, because I've been, you know, I'll call it classically trained in journalism, um, I can tell when you have an opinionated, you know, piece of journalism versus something that is just cold, hard facts. It's so obvious to me, but unfortunately, the the, the average person will watch the news and will not pick up on the fact that that 90 plus percent of that broadcast was all opinionated. And while there are facts maybe drawing those opinions, all you got from that was someone's very strong opinions and either they convinced you or they didn't. Like, I feel like I'm in a courtroom. You know what I mean? I watch the news and I think I'm in a courtroom like, oh, who made the better testimony here? And that's that's what I'm going to go with versus what are the facts in this story? Yeah, that, and you're you're so right because so much of our media landscape um, has become kind of partisan, and it's and it is so opinionated where people will, um, you, you know, we, we talk about the news in left wing and right wing, and you shouldn't be able to say kind of where someone got their news from by the facts that they're conveying. Yes, um, but but you often can because again, what people are saying is so colored by. Um, kind of all of all of their beliefs, whether unconscious or or subconscious or conscious or unconscious, I should say. Um, go ahead. No, I was going to say. So, how has that impacted the work that you guys do, for example? Yeah. So, what we're what I really wanted to kind of focus on is kind of depictions of crime in the media, because this is where we see um, a great deal of studied bias in, in reporting and how that bias kind of impacts everything else. So, for example, um, when we are looking at coverage of a crime, when it is committed by a black person, mug shots are used in 45 percent of the cases of, of media coverage of that crime. For the same crime, so, you know, the same severity, same same general circumstances, only 8% of white defendants have their mugshot used. So the impression wow. taken away is, uh, you know, mugshots, that is a person who's who's guilty already. Um, you know, they are they are a threat, whereas you just don't get that same for, for white defendants. Same thing with um, pictures of white victims. They are nearly four times more likely to present to be seen in photos with friends and family than black victims. So again, we it, it just spins this narrative, and the average person who's kind of seeing this has has no idea that even just the pictures that they're seeing are giving this narrative, and that that is going to impact how they uh, 
how they kind of react to the story and how they react to the people that they see on the street. Um, wow. One of the kind of, those yeah. are those are really jar- the, I just think those are very jarring percentages. Um, yeah, that's a lot to digest. I uh, that's that's unbelievable. Yeah, well, it, it gets even worse because um, there was a recent study by the um, Equal Justice Initiative that found that they they did a analysis of the, an analysis of the words used to describe defendants. So for white defendants, the top three terms were man, son, and father. For black defendants, the top three terms were murder, accused, and arrested. So, again, mm. even just the language used wow. is going – it, it is for giving this narrative. Um, and, and it's entirely kind of something that you may not even be aware that you're kind of picking up on that narrative. Um, and, and it just kind of goes on and on where we, we see just over and over again that the way people are treated and, and covered in the media is not the same. Um, and I it's just, not just black I, men. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say I find that really interesting. We're talking to Spencer Hill this morning of the uh, Commission on Human Rights and Opportunities. I find it really interesting because we're so hyper focused and we're also living in a very I'm gonna call it like a, a woke generation, a very cancel yeah. Yeah. culture generation. Like I find that very shocking because. And I'm not saying that your facts are incorrect. I, I mean, you have plain data showing that. And I'm just wondering what made that shift. Um, because, as I mentioned, when I was learning how to write news stories, I've I've never referred to somebody, at, unless you are convicted of a crime, like you were convicted of a yep. murder, regardless of your race, you, you are a convicted murderer. That's who you are. But when you're accused of something like, you know, a, a Bridgeport woman, a Bridgeport man, or uh, like, I'll go by the town or the city. Um, but yeah. I've, I've never, I, I don't think I've ever in, in my understanding that, or my recollection, I don't think I've ever referred to based on their race uh, to, to, um, people who are are suspects in a case i've never referred to them differently that's so unbelievable to me that's crazy yeah and in part it's kind of just like i said it's kind of just the hyper partisan nature of of the news media landscape Mm. where we have these kind of 24-hour news cycles and and you have to fill time and so you kind of just you get into the mode of presenting things in a way that is going to grab attention quick um, is going to give people kind of a clear understanding. And in giving that understanding, you use shortcuts, or, or not you, but, you know, the media reporters can use shortcuts to say, um, you know, black man, scary crime. That's that's the quick narrative, and they can really get attention with that. White man, sympathetic loner. Um, you know, when we're talking about terrorist incidents, a Muslim terrorist, whereas, you know, if a, a white person commits the same kind of acts, they don't get called a terrorist. They get call, called a troubled individual, and it's about mental health. Or an um, attacker or something, it, sure. It not, right. It, exactly. But but it's just not the same coverage for, for every group, and, and it's really wow. damaging. It, it colors how we see the world. Mm. It's so interesting. And I think, you know, Spencer, I think you bring up a great topic that people should be very, again, just very aware. And and you have to train your mind to pick up on those bias. You know, you have to train your mind to see, okay, this is different than than this. And it takes time. But I think once you do have a brain that sees it, it is very blatantly obvious. Very much so. Yeah, absolutely. And that is such a critical skill. Uh, You know, the Internet is here to stay. News reporting is is never going to go back to kind of the, you know, the three television stations. Um, The Cronkite years. Yeah, we we have a responsibility to to educate ourselves Mm -hmm. and to be critical about the news that we're reading because it's just going to get harder to kind of have that um, objective truth kind of out there. Mm -hmm. Spencer, we appreciate you bringing this topic to our airwaves. Thank you so much.